people you see this morning. What a great day of celebration we're going to have today, uh, celebrating the revival uh, that we have been having. Uh, and so we'll speak more about that. I want to, my name's Shane Embry, I'm the pastor here, for those you don't know. Uh, appreciate, uh, I mentioned this Thursday night, I appreciate Alan <laughs> kind of relinquishing his hymnal for me as he usually leads our, our singing, but uh, uh, just, you know, I told you, I a pastor, you have to have our egos fed a little bit, so this is a way that I can still be up here in front of you. So I'm going to ask you to take your hymnals and stand with me as we sing hymn 517. We'll do the first, third, and fourth verse of I Will Sing of My Redeemer. smell uh, following our service uh, it's not news most of you can smell yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. which is always tough because when, when you have to compete with a meal that's being compared prepared so but uh, following our morning service we have a meal that we would invite everybody to be a part of uh, and so if you can stick around, we'd love for you to come, stick around and have a meal with us. And then following that meal, we'll come back up here for just a brief service to celebrate our 190th anniversary of the church. Uh, or as I like to say, God just getting started with us, right? So, uh, so uh, uh, today um, we've been taking up an offering during a revival time, that offering is a love offering for Abram. Um, so you may have come this morning prepared to give your regular offering. Uh, if you want to, and hopefully you do, want to give a love offering as part of a revival offering, you'll see the little yellow envelopes in your pew. There should be somewhere around you. Uh, and so if you want to give a, for your love offering, a revival love offering, if you just put that in that envelope, so we'll be able to tell the two apart. Um, I think that's all I have as far as announcements. I'm excited. Are you excited? Are you glad to be here? Amen. Amen. We can say, you know, we don't even have to wait and say, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. We can say now, it is good to be here already right now. And I'm just so excited about our celebration this morning. All right, well, I'm going to ask you to take your hymnals again with me. Turn to hymn 441. <laughs> hymn 441. Jesus will say, though they are smiting him, 
celebrating 190 years of this church. As I think about that, I think back at the people that's been through this church. And there's been a lot that I don't know. But there's been some good ones to lead through this. One was uh, that I could think of was Miss Norman's uh, Jenny Monroe. One was James and Ruth Childs. The Conrads. Um, one of the greatest women I've ever met was David and Patty's mom, my grandmother, Ruby, sat there every Sunday morning. <laughs> Avery, you got about 200 people in your church, <laughs> right? Yeah. I bet we got you beat. Have you ever had a dog yep. attend church every Sunday? Yep. Every <laughs> Sunday. Not every Sunday, but we had a couple. <laughs> <laughs> my grandmother had a dog. You can ask David. He'd be out here every Sunday morning, wouldn't he? And, uh, Sat behind the beginner Sunday school class, class where Jerry and my son Marty were members. He'd sit there at that window, and they put him on the road. <laughs> 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 we had uh, Tommy and Ann Ammerman, some that's gone on here recently, um, James and Phyllis, or not James, uh, Richard and Phyllis, and all them. But I'm sure each one of us can think back of somebody that stood out to us in this church. And one of them would be mine would be Bob Turner. Bob always had a kind word. He always spoke up. And he was just always smiling, always had a positive thing to say. And every Sunday morning, the Sunday mornings that he did this, he would always open with a joke just to lighten people up. And he always had a positive word. You know, he always spoke positive. And I can always remember his saying was he was glad to be part of a church that was a Bible believing, God fearing church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was his thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, and in his honor, I'd like to tell one of his jokes that he told. <laughs> that this really stood out to me. But he said one day he go. Uh, it was work was hard to come by down here. He said, but Canada had all kind of work. So he and Shane decided, well, we'll go up to Canada and get a job, you know, work until things cleared out down here. So he, uh, so they headed up there. Shane, or Bob goes, Shane, won't you go first? So Shane goes up and says, they said, what's your occupation? He says, well, I'm a pilot. They're flipping through the papers. Oh yeah, yeah, we need pilots. We, Need several of them, so come on in, yeah. So next thing Bob stops up. Hey, so what do you do? He says, I'm a wood splitter. They flip into no, no, we don't see nothing about no wood splitters. 
He said, are you sure? He said, can you check again? So they flipped through their papers again. And uh, nope, nothing, nothing to be found. But he goes, but you let him in, Shane? He said, well, yeah, but he's a pilot. And Bob goes, well, he can't pilot till I split it. <laughs> and that was just one of <laughs> But uh, if you want to start turning to Matthew, like I said, chapter 16, um, prayer concerns. Anybody we need to add, remove, updates? I have two updates. Go ahead. Anybody else? Any add ons, take offs, updates, praises? I've got a praise. Yes, sir. Okay. Most of you remember that uh, my daughter, she lives in England now. Her sister in law has uh, cancer. There was a spot close to her heart. And she also had melanoma on her head, forehead. And this has been going on for probably a year. She's been on our prayer list at Mount Carmel for probably about a year. I talked to my daughter the other day. She's gone through chemo, I do believe. They took the lining around the heart and the lungs, one of the linings away to help the radiation kill the cancer around the heart. Uh, but the, the praise is that we've been praying for her. Uh, and even though they're not churchgoers, a church has adopted them. They bring uh, food to the family. Uh, they've even uh, given money anonymously through the mailbox to them. And uh, so so God is, is healing and working in their hearts. And it's a, it's a it's a beautiful thing when we as Christians reach out to other people mm -hmm. that are hurting and can help, we can help with our words of kindness as you said Bob was always good at. Yes. Amen. God. So I praise God that he's working and answering prayers. I don't understand why God allows our prayers to be answered, but it seems like it takes our prayers sometimes things to happen. So, uh, praise the Lord that he is good and kind and faithful. Anybody else? Jerry, I just got a reminder jump through my head here. One night sports came forward. The dog come through the back door and all the way to the front aisle. The first thing to come forward in this church is probably two or three years. <laughs> <laughs> he was faithful. <laughs> Anybody else before we leave? If not, if you'll speak, stand for God's word. Um, I'm going to read chapter, or chapter 16, verse 18, and it says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will overcome it. This church has been standing, or been in existence for 190 years, and hopefully many more. So. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, Lord. We just praise you, Lord. Thank you for those few people that's hanging back on the wall of the names that you gave them ability to get this church started over 190 years ago, Lord. Lord, it's gone through its times and troubles and greatness and everything else, but it still stands up on this hill, Lord, and with the church in it, in this building. Lord, we just praise you and thank you for the many years that we've had, and we just pray for the many more that could come and the people that's been through this church, Lord, that's just kept it going, kept it going strong, Lord. 
I pray that there's many more that, that will keep it going even longer. Lord, I pray that the speaker today, Brother Abram Cruiser, will hide behind the cross, Lord, and bring your word that we can lay upon our hearts and take it home with us, Lord. Lord, just forgive us of sin if we fail you. I pray in these name. Amen. Amen. And also, too, you know you're going to call me Adam, right? I know. <laughs> I'm sure it's not the first time. It's not Adam. I've been called worse. I've been called worse. I'm, I'm one of nine, so we, we kind of got called everything in between. My poor, y'all told me my poor younger brother answered to my name more than he did his own. <laughs> yeah. so. All right, take your hymn, hymn 437. We will say the first, third, and fourth verses. Send the light. Oh, it's in the first and last. Send the light. There's a ball. Father, Lord, we just uh, thank you, Lord, for another day you've given to us. Lord, we just thank you for this time of gathering. Lord, we just ask that you be at the camping here at this time. We ask all this in your son's name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. supposed to sing this song how many weeks ago <laughs> several <laughs> several weeks ago <laughs> and circumstances just kept inspiring to keep us from singing this song it was just ridiculous people were getting sick and going places and what have you and you said something the other night and I, this is gonna be perfect this is the perfect song to sing on sunday so. <laughs> <laughs> One. 
so blessed these last several evenings and several days to have Brother Abram with us. Blessed, we've been challenged. I don't know about you. Abram, we walked out of here last night and I, I told Kathy, I said, I don't know about anybody else, but I think I'm the person who needed that <laughs> message last night. Amen. Uh, I'm excited about what God's going to speak for you. Brother, come on up and share his word with us. I, am I allowed to play the piano? Can I play the piano? Is that all right? <laughs> if I can, that's a good point. I don't know. <laughs> I, haven't, uh, I haven't played this song in a long time, but...
churches in my lifetime. I, my dad would preach revivals growing up. We attended a lot of churches growing up. Me and my brothers were in a Christian rock band and we'd go to churches all across the tri-state and scare them half to death. <laughs> and now that I've been a pastor, I've probably hit 30, 40 different churches in the last five years. And, and I just want you to know what a joy that it's been just to be with you guys this week. Uh, it's blessed my heart. And, and, and listen, I, I, I just, this is my, this is my biggest prayer. Uh, that after I leave, you guys don't go back to normal as business, all right? Amen. When you lay your head down at night, I hope and pray that you have nightmares of Abram Crozier chasing you, <laughs> saying, no more excuses! <laughs> no more. I'm only kidding. You know, it doesn't have to be a nightmare, okay? <laughs> when, when we as the church realize that we are nothing but broken people. Yes. People are going to suffer through these lives and people are going through uh, times of hurt and people are unsure of what tomorrow holds for them. Yeah. Then when the lost and the dying show up to the church, we'll be ready to do what God has called us to do, which is to just love them. Amen. Because the only difference between us and those who are far from God is that we have Christ. And we have a hope to live for. But everyone I meet, it doesn't matter if they're an atheist or a Christian. Everybody's trying to live better today than they did yesterday. And here's the thing. We figured out how. Amen. Because of Jesus Christ. Amen. A secret that should not be kept Amen. secret at all. And so thank you for allowing me to be with you this week. Pastor Shane, uh, thank you for the invite. I hope you didn't have to put out any fires this week. And uh, <laughs> hopefully you'll still have a job when I leave. So. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I tell my, my church all the time. Uh, we are not perfect people, right? We just serve a perfect God, and uh, the church will fail you. The church is going to fail you. We will make mistakes. We won't always get it right, but we will always try to honor God to the best of our ability. And I also tell people, our church at Trinity, we're, we're like fudge, sweet with a few nuts. And, uh, <laughs> the, the nutty ones know who they are, and we still love them, all right? Let's all stand for reading of God's holy word. <laughs> Hope y'all are ready for this today. Isaiah chapter 6, starting with verse 8. I'm only going to preach one verse here today, so it's going to go easy because the smell is, is uh, making me hungry. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Before you sit down, make the sound of your favorite animal, and then you can be seated. Go ahead. Then you can, if you did it, you can set. I just wanted to see if anybody would do it. An elephant's not even my favorite animal, but I thought it'd be funny. Uh, here's something you have to understand. It says in John 19, verse 30, Jesus said, it is finished while he was hanging on the cross. One of the last seven sayings of our Lord. He did not have to stay around after the resurrection to complete the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation was completed when he hung on the cross Amen. and died for us. Amen. But after the resurrection, the leaders at the time tried to tell people that the, that tell the people that the disciples had stolen the body of Jesus and were hiding it. And do you, you know what Jesus did? He showed up. Amen. He showed up. He stayed around for 40 days so people would know that he was not stolen, but that he was alive. Yeah. Eleven times in total, he appeared to people. He appeared to Mary. She thought he was a gardener at first. He appeared to the ten disciples. 
Thomas wasn't there and Judas was dead. Eight days later in John 20, uh, 20, 26, he appeared to the 11 again. He appeared to the disciples on the road. He appeared to the disciples on the bank of the sea. He, he Here's one of my favorite appearances, and this is something I want to talk about. It's one of my favorites. Uh, whether you're a visitor here, whether you're a member of this church, whether you're a member of Trinity, whatever the case is, uh, this is the perfect day to be here because I want to share with you something that really encourages me. As fun as revival is, as encouraging as revival uh, can be for us as Christian to today is not where revival ends revival this is just the beginning Amen. it's just the beginning when, when revival broke out at Asbury University in the 70s does anybody, anybody remember those some of y'all that should be you know y'all were 50 okay. in the 70s when, when revival broke out at Asbury uh, University they did not just stick around the university and hang out and, and, and chill out in the chapel. You know what they did? This is what revival is. You know what they did? They left the chapel and they went out to the town of Wilmore and they started knocking on the doors and sharing the gospel with people. That is what revival is. Yeah. Billy Graham, when he would come into a town, he would always make sure he, he talked with pastors and worked with pastors because he said, I'm here only for a few days or a few weeks. But he said, I'm sending everyone Back to the local church to do the work that God has called you to do. And what is the work that God has called us to do? Well, right before Jesus sends into heaven, he meets with his disciples and he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I have commanded you and let me tell you something. I, I always tell people I'm afraid. Of, I'm afraid of heights. I don't like planes. I don't. I don't go up in the. I don't go up in the air. I don't like going up high. You know, Christmas. I got to hang up the lights. It scares me half to death. And I say it's biblical. Why? Because right after he gives them the great commission, you know what he says? Lo, I am with you always. He didn't say hi. He said, he said lo, I'm with you all. <laughs> That's a joke. Okay. <laughs> people hear the great commission though, and they think. We have to go and travel overseas in order to fulfill the Great Commission. Well, that's not exactly what he meant. He said, go make disciples of all nations. He didn't say every Christian has to go to all nations. Up to this point, the covenant that God made was with the nation of Israel. But now, Jesus is saying that the new covenant is for all nations. It is for every individual who will call on his name, not just one particular group of people. The reason that's important is because as important as overseas mission is, and I encourage each and every one of you to su support overseas missions, but I'm telling you, uh, 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 it is just as important, equally as important, to reach our neighbors, yeah, yeah. To, to reach our co-workers, to reach our family members and friends, yeah. those we run into the gas station when you're, when you're shopping at Home Depot. That is also our mission field. Yeah, yeah. This spring, I was putting mulch around my house, doing manly things, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Just manly stuff, and I'm in I'm in the garden center of Home Depot, and and I, I always I used to work for Scott's Miracle Grow, and so uh, I I know I know my way around Home Depot. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I, I I know I don't look like it all the time, but we used to we used to travel to all the Home Depots and the Lowe's, and we'd set up display cases and stock shelves, and and we'd get our products front and center, looking to uh, destroy our competition in the uh, grass, seed, and fertilizer uh, business. Um, it was one of my favorite jobs. But it was seasonal, so I didn't get to do it all the time. But uh, when I walk into a Home Depot now, you know what I'm saying? I, I may not look like I know a lot about plumbing or light fixtures, okay? But when it comes to turf and agriculture seeding uh, and weed destroying, uh, I am the guy. You know what I'm saying? I am the guy. And so while I was in the garden center, I, I, I you know, I get my Scott's Miracle Road uh, 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 mulch and I'm putting it in my, my cart and I got tons of them. And, and I get behind this line, and I'm telling you, this old guy in front of me, he has a cart of rubber mulch, rubber mulch. And he looks back at me, and he says, I remember when I was young and stupid. I said, what? What you, what you say to me? I've never fought anybody in my entire life, and I thought, here it is. This is going to be the day. Me and an old man in Home Depot. I can see the headlines now. Local pastor beats up an old man in Home Depot. You know what I'm saying? Scared me half to death. I thought, what did you call me? He's like, young and stupid. He said, I used to put mulch around my house all the time. Now I put down rubber mulch. And at first, I had a really witty comeback that my pastor probably shouldn't say. And thankfully, I didn't say it. Okay? Because, listen, it usually takes me days to come up with, usually takes me 
need days to come up with a comeback. And I had one. Ooh, I was so ready. Uh, but I paused for half a second. Uh, and then I remembered, if he's old and grouchy, he must be a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, uh, I said, you sound like you should be at my church. And uh, he said, because <laughs> everybody at my church likes to groan and moan. And <laughs> I said, every time I put mulch out of my church, everybody complains about it. We should put rocks out there, Abram. We shouldn't have mulch. Okay, calm down, everybody, calm down. But we talked a little bit, me and this old man, and he shared some of the hurt that he had at a church years ago. He said he hasn't been back to church since, and, and I recommended a few churches, called one of the local pastors, and had him reach out to this old man. And I told the pastor, I said, be careful. He's got a loud bark. Oh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but just because you're hurting, let me tell you something, doesn't mean you don't get a chance to heal or a chance to worship or a chance to be part of a loving Christian family, all right? We let our emotions dictate our worship. We let our emotions dictate whether we go to church or not. And that should never be the case because no matter how you feel, God is always worthy to be praised. So look at this passage. We see God commission Isaiah just like Jesus commissioned his followers in Matthew chapter 28. But here's something that, that we can learn from Isaiah's response as we apply the great commission to our life. The first thing is, this is my first point if you're writing these down, we need to accept the call. We need to accept the call. Before you leave here today, you've got to make a decision. It is not good enough just to say, okay, God, I will follow you. God, I'll show up to church every once in a while. God, I'll make sure I don't miss any Christmas service or Easter service. I'll bring the kids to those things. Those aren't too terrible. Uh, and then nothing changes in your life. Okay, God, I'll, I'll go get baptized, but my language isn't going to change. What I do behind closed doors isn't going to change. The bad influences in my life isn't going to change. Let me tell you something. Following God, and I mean truly, truly following God, means a significant change yeah, in yeah. your life. It's not just saying a sinner's prayer and hoping everything is good, but it is repenting of your sins. Amen. Repenting of your sins. We don't, we don't use that word anymore in our churches. Oh, even that, that word, you got to stay away from that word. We don't understand it. We don't like it. Let me tell you what repentance means. It means to turn away from. It means to go back to God. We need to repent. We need to commit our lives to him. It's saying, God, I'm going to follow you regardless of what my children think, regardless of what my family thinks, regardless of what my friends think, regardless of what my coworkers may think. And let me give you this warning. If you think you can follow God, and I mean truly follow God, and still keep everybody in your life that you used to, you're in for a rude awakening. I have family members that will not speak to me because I accepted the call to be a pastor. I, I have friends that want nothing to do with me because I accepted the call to be a pastor. I have people in this town who walk the other way when they hear Trinity Southern Baptist is involved with something because they go, we don't want to deal with them. You know, I, I don't want their... I know we're crazy. You don't have to tell me, you know. Uh, but the old mentality of our of our churches, what, you know what they used to be? They used to say, you know, you stay on your street and I'll stay on my street. You don't come over here. Well, let me tell you something. I don't care what street it is. If there's lost people on that street, guess where I'm going? I'm going to go to the lost people. Amen. You get what I'm saying? We, we need to, we, I didn't accept the call just to stay on Broad Street in Falmouth, Kentucky. I accepted the call to preach God's word anywhere, Amen. anytime, anyhow. We accepted the call to reach our community for Christ. And if nobody else is going to do it, I'll do it. Even the thief on the cross evangelized. Y'all know that? Yes. Even the thief on the cross evangelized. He was a witness to the other thief. He said, don't you know who this is? He said, we deserve death. He is perfect, but look at what he's doing. Our job is to go and tell. Amen. To go and tell. Revival doesn't end after the invitation today. Revival should continue long after I'm gone. And the best way to keep revival going at a church is to go and Tell. Amen. Go and tell. When I was a kid at, at Southern Elementary, we used to have a we used to have a thing where they it was called the show and tell. Y'all remember this? You would bring something or someone to your classroom to show to the class and tell about it. Well, I don't know if they still do that. <laughs> but can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? How about we show and tell Jesus every once in a while? You got to go to work, say, hey, get, we're going to do a show and tell, just like I did in elementary school. Let me show you about Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus. Accept the call. Amen. 
the greatest sin in our churches are silent mouths and cold hearts. Yes. It's the greatest sin in our churches. The greatest sin. Before we can ever accept the call to follow Jesus or to make disciples, to baptize, to evangelize, we have to recognize first that we're sinners. And more than that, we need to repent of those sins. In verse 5 of this chapter, Isaiah recognized his sinfulness. He says, woe to me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. I always, I always, I always see people who go to church. It's, it seems like it's always the church people say, don't judge me. It's always a church people. Don't judge me, Abram. Okay? Because you're no better than me. Cool. Great. I actually agree with that. Amen. I agree with that. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't judge yourself. Amen. That's right. that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't mean you get to continue to live in your own sin. If you know what is wrong and you still do it, you are defying God. Recognize the sin. Eliminate the sin. Recognize the sin. Eliminate the sin. Here's my challenge to the one sitting in this church here today. If you got a sin in your life that is taking more priority over God, I'm telling you, here's my challenge. This week, you better erase that sin from your life. Just do it for one week and see how better your life's going to be. Right, right. Just do it for one week. Make a commitment to fast from whatever sin that you have in your life for one week. And then next Sunday, you can come here and praise God for how great your week has been. Amen. Sin kills. We cannot keep living in sin and accept God, expect God to bless us. We cannot keep living in sin and expect God to heal us or protect us from this chaotic world. Now, don't misunderstand me. You can expect God to love you because he'll love you no matter what. Nothing separates us from the love of God. But unlike our society, God's love is a tough love. Yes. It is a tough love. In our society, uh, little Jimmy uh, is, a, is, a, is a brat and annoying. And the parents just keep giving little Jimmy what he wants. You know what I'm saying? Leave, just as long as he leaves them alone. This is what our society is doing today. And the parents, they just keep feeding into Jimmy. And that's all fine and dandy. But let me tell you something. Just because little Jimmy's out of your hair. Hope nobody's named Jimmy in here. It does not mean he's, it doesn't mean he's out of our hair. Because guess what? Eventually little Jimmy grows up. And little Jimmy has to go into our culture and our society. And he has to, he has, I, get, I always get that phone call. Pastor, um, Pastor Abram, can you reach out to my grown kid? I go, what's going on? Oh, I don't know. He grew up in church. I always made sure he was in Sunday school. I did all that I did all that I'm supposed to do, and now he wants nothing to do with God. You know, I, I, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. All right, you think church is going to save little Jimmy? You think just dragging him to Sunday school is going to change little Jimmy? If things don't change in your home, the church can't do anything. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Church, we get them for an hour. And the entire, y'all get them for the rest of the week. And I'm telling you, like I said on Thursday, they watch everything that we do. We see God loves you enough. To, this is why I love God's love. God loves you enough to let you hit rock bottom. Did y'all know that? Yes. He loves you enough to yes. let you hit rock bottom. Right. So there's nowhere else to look but up. Nowhere else. God loves you enough to discipline you. So we need to recognize our sins because then God can open up the doors of your life. Because in this chapter, after Isaiah confesses his sin, God asks the question. It's a question I want you to think long and hard about this morning because it's a question that we all need to answer. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? That's the question. And we see the response of Isaiah without any hesitation. He says, here am I, send me Lord. And usually past pastors, they'll end right there. They'll say, hallelujah, y'all need to go out there and, and we'll end it right there. And, and, you know, we need to go out just like Isaiah. And they're right. That should be our answer. We should be ready and willing, willing to bust the doors down on behalf of Jesus. We should be willing to go to the ends of the earth preaching the message of salvation. We should be able to stand up and say, though none go with me, I still will follow. But we skip over the message that Isaiah was called to preach. We missed the message. God says, who's going to go for us? Isaiah says, I will. And then we miss the rest of it. We skip the actual message that he was called to preach. You see, if you're going to accept the call to go, therefore, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them everything Jesus commanded us, then we also have to accept the last part, everything that Jesus commanded us. In order to accept the call, we also have to accept the message, which is my second point. I have been preaching uh, through the book of Revelation at Trinity over the last few months, and uh because I wanted our church to understand that God is not just one-sided. We don't just serve the God of love. 
We don't just serve the God of forgiveness, right? God is, is not just grace and mercy. He is also judgment. He is also wrath. He is also patient. He is also caring. He's all these things wrapped up in one. And all of these attributes of God are perfect. And they work in perfect harmony. He's a perfect God. His love is perfect. His judgment is perfect. His peace is perfect. His wrath is perfect. But a lot of times in our churches, we want to point out one attribute of God and just say God is love. Yeah, well, he's also wrath. Yes, right. We need to know who he is so that we can preach his word effectively. We need to know the message and accept the, the message in order to truly follow God. You know what the message was for Isaiah? It wasn't a pleasant message. It wasn't a pleasant call that he had to preach. God said, go tell the people this. You all listen to this? Fulfill your destiny. Stay true to your heart. Speak victory, not defeat. The more people try to push you down, the higher God will take. I'm just kidding. Those are all. Joel Osteen quotes. I just took them. Those are all titles to books, I think, of, of Joel Osteen. That's not even close to what God told Isaiah. God told Isaiah, he said, preach this message to the people. He says, keep on listening, but do not understand. Keep on looking, but do not gain knowledge. Make the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes blind, so that they will not see with their eyes hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. That is pretty harsh. It goes on to talk about how cities would be devastated and, 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 and without in, inhabitants. Houses will be without people and the land completely destroyed if they keep on the path that they're heading. And here's what's crazy. Isaiah accepted the call before hearing the message. Is that crazy? Praise the Lord. He accepted the call before hearing the message, but the message was one of judgment because the people of Judah were being disobedient to God. And so his message wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, but it was consequence and judgment. And at the end of the Great Commission, Jesus tells us to make disciples, baptize them, and then teach them everything he commanded us. And do you know what Jesus commanded us? That we love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, regardless of who leaves us. Amen. That means we put God before everything. Yeah. Our political viewpoint. That's right. God has to come before it. Our families, God has to come before it. Our careers, God has to come before it. Our material things that we know and we want and we can't. Oh, I wish I, uh, holidays are coming up. I got to get on Amazon because I need this and I need that. You got to put God before it. Let me tell you this. Our spouse. We're supposed to put God before our spouse. Y'all know that? And the majority of us can't do those things. Because that alone is a hard message to preach. Because that message means we live by God's definition of marriage. We live by God's definition of identity. We live by God's definition of holy. Yes. We live by God's standard, not our own. Yes. Secondly, we see that the teachings of Jesus calls us to love our neighbors. Yes. Even the neighbors that we cannot stand. Right. Right. Yes. This, this, this year, me and my wife got a new fence we're going to put up around our house. We had an old beat up chain link fence, you know what I'm saying, poking. When, when you become a parent, you see all the ways your children could die. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like they're doing like just simple things, but you're like, man, if you hit that ball and it hits that light and that light comes crashing down on your head, you're going to die. And you go, stop kissing the ball. It's the weirdest thing. So every time I saw that fence, I'm like, oh my gosh, they're going to poke an eye out. They're going to, you know, stab themselves to death. I got and so we got a new fence. Oh my gosh, you would think we were the devil himself because our neighbor was so upset that we were putting up a fence. Uh -huh. No, you weren't. You're not going we've had that fence there since the 1973. I said, I know. I can tell. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was unbelievable. But guess what? You still gotta love your neighbor. Amen. Amen. The neighbors that don't love us, we gotta love them. We're to love our neighbors in our community. We're to love those who are far from God. We are to preach a message of repentance, preach a message of holiness. We are to lay up our treasures in heaven and not on earth. The, the teachings of Jesus tells us to live under the grace of God, not by our, our own definition of how we want to live our life, but it has to be by God's definition. Amen. By God's definition. And what's scary about preaching this message is the world hates this message. Yeah. In 2023, it hates this message. The world protests this message. The world cancels anyone who dares to speak about this message. This message doesn't take into consideration feelings. It doesn't take in. <laughs> God doesn't care how you feel. Okay? 
I always tell people, you know, if you're looking for a happy church where you're just happy every day, okay, come up here and let me kick you. Okay, I, I can turn that emotion upside down real quick. You know what I'm saying? The message doesn't take in consideration feelings. The message doesn't take in consideration the agenda the world is pushing. And most people don't get this far. We say we accept the call. We try to accept the message. But when it's time to preach the message, we go silent. We have to understand if we accept the call and accept the message, and we have to accept uh, uh, the cost of preaching. This is my last point. We have to accept the cost of the message. I had a member say to me once, kind of nonchalantly, she said, she said, Abe, I've lost so many friends since giving my life over to Christ. She said, it doesn't bother me one bit. And I thought, man, that's what it means to accept the cost. Yeah. Are you willing to accept the cost of following God? giving up your old ways of life, following God, giving up the social gatherings that made you feel important to follow God so you won't be a stumbling block anymore to say, you know what, I can't go to that wedding, I can't go on that trip because I know I will not be able to fight the temptations of my old friends. I would rather miss that trip or miss that wedding and stay true to God than sit there and fall short of God's will. Amen. When you say, here am I, send me, you're not only accepting the message that comes with accepting the kind of call, you're also accepting the cost. Ask the apostles what it means to accept the cost for following Christ. Paul was beheaded for preaching the gospel. Peter was crucified upside down at his request because he did not feel worthy to die the same way Jesus did. Andrew went to the land of the man-eaters and was crucified. Thomas was stabbed with spears by four soldiers. The apostle Philip converted the wife of a Roman leader to Christianity in retaliation. The leader had Philip arrested and cruelly put to death. Matthew was stabbed, stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Bartholomew was murdered for preaching the gospel. James was stoned and clubbed to death. Simon was killed in Persia because he refused to sacrifice to the sun god. The apostle Matthias, who replaced Judas, was burned to death. John was the only one who died of an old age. But the only reason he got to live so long was because they sentenced him to burn in a boiling pot of oil. But he somehow survived. <laughs> So they let him go. Could you imagine what he looked like the rest of his life? We have trouble showing up to church on Sundays. We, 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 if the cost of following God was just showing up to church on Sundays, we would have a big problem in our churches. Because we can't even do that part. Here's what's even scarier. The cost is more than just showing up. The cost of following Christ is everything. All that I have and all that I am is Christ. I don't get to pick and choose when I'm a Christian and when I'm not. You know what I'm saying? I don't get to wake up on Monday and say, you know what? I'm going to take the day off. You know? I had a pastor. <laughs> he's no longer in the ministry. But he said, uh, right when I first started Trinity, he said, Abram, let me give you a little advice. I always go to out to dinner in a different state. I go, what? He's like, uh-huh. Abram, trust me. When I get, when I want to have dinner, I go to a different state where nobody knows I'm a pastor. I go, what? <laughs> That's fine if you want to don't nobody know you're a pastor. But guess what? You're still a Christian. Yeah. What you don't you don't get to take off your pastor hat on Monday. We're a pastor every day. You don't get to take off your Christian hat on Monday. You have, you're a Christian when you wake up and go to sleep. It's unbelievable. When I'm at my house, I'm a Christian. When I'm at work, I'm a Christian. When, when, when I'm out and about, I'm a born-again believer. When I'm at the store, I'm a Christian. Yeah. When I'm at the restaurant and the and the waitress is horrible. You're gonna some of y'all are gonna go out to eat. I, I tonight I'm sure. Although I heard this is gonna be some good food today. I asked, I, I, I tried to give everybody a hint yesterday, Romans 14, 2. Vegetables. Right. <laughs> but I was assured there's some good food in there. If y'all go out to eat tonight, tomorrow, whatever it is and that waitress is terrible, guess what? You're still a Christian. Yes. When I'm struggling to make ends meet, I'm a born-again believer. I don't get to take off the Christian hat and put it on when I feel like it. I got to follow Christ until he calls me home. Question today is, can you say the same? Have you ever seen when a store is bought out? It seems like it happens a lot in Fountain. It seems like uh, a lot of times they'll put a, a, a sign in the front of, of the store uh, or a banner and it says under new management. When you give your life to Christ, we should put that on our head. Yeah. Under new management. All right. When you accept the call and message and following Christ, we're under new management. Your life is 
no longer your own, but it now belongs to God. The Bible says, if any man comes to Christ, he is a new creation. And you can make that decision this morning, right here, right now. You can walk out of this church doors a new person. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Some of you have heard a message for the last four days, a message challenging you not to give up, a message challenging you not to make excuses, to surrender to God once and for all. The question is, are you going to do something about it or are you just going to keep sitting there? I cannot tell you how many times I said bye to somebody on a, on a Sunday afternoon as they're leaving church and I was doing their funeral before the week was out. This may be the last opportunity you have to do business with God. To fully surrender your life to God. To make a decision to be baptized. Listen, there is nothing special about baptism waters. I tell my church all the time, it's found with water. Hey, and trust me, sometimes it comes out a different color. You know what I'm saying? We just pray to God to heal us and we go under the water and it's insane. But uh, uh, <laughs> there's nothing different. Uh, there's nothing special about the water. It's you standing up and saying, look. I am going to tell the world that I'm not ashamed to be a Christ follower. Amen. I'm going to die to my own self and be raised new. Amen. Like I said all week, I cannot make that decision for you. This has to be between you and God. All we ask you to come forward and let us pray and celebrate that decision for you. In a moment, I'm going to ask you publicly to make that commitment to stand up and say, today I give my life to Jesus. Today, God, I give you my all in all. And today I want to be saved. The Bible says all you have to do is confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and you can be saved. You can have your sins forgiven. You can have e uh, a heaven as your eternal address. Amen. How amazing is that? Yeah. The Bible says you can choose life or death, Christ or chaos, heaven or hell. Mm -hmm. Christ did the hard part when he went to that cross to die for us. Amen. All we have to do is receive that free gift of salvation and surrender to him. So with every head bowed and every eyes closed, Every head bowed, every eyes closed. You're here today and you're ready to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. You want to be baptized. You want a relationship with Jesus Christ. All I'm going to ask you to do is to come forward. Let me or Pastor Shane talk with you. If you need to come to this altar for a time of prayer, a time of surrender, for a time of repentance, the altar is open. If you just refuse to come to this altar, I ask that you to pray at your seat for that lost person that's here today. That they will finally make a decision to follow Christ once and for all. And if that's you, do not leave here today without letting somebody know that you're ready to become a Christian. With every head bowed, every eyes closed, after this prayer, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Let us pray. Dear and gracious Father, you know the hearts of every single person in this room. You know their deepest and darkest secrets. You know their past, present, and future. And I'm asking you today, dear God, to speak to them in such a way that they no longer can sit in that pew, God, but they feel like they need to finally make a commitment to fully surrender to you, dear Lord. Thank you for the faithfulness of this church. We also know, God, if we want to make it another 190 years, it has to start at the altar and continue outside of these four walls. God, I turn this service fully over to you. Allow your Holy Spirit to flood this place and let us rejoice, not over anything that I have done, God, but for everything that you're about to do. So in Jesus' precious name I pray. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Take your hand up. We'll sing hymn 593. Abram has reminded us this evening, for the last few evenings, that this is the most important part of the service, because it's a response. It's a chance for us to respond to the Spirit's leading. Are you willing to do that today, as we stand and as we sing? Don't just stand there when you know God's speaking to you. Allow this church to celebrate with you in the decision you need to make. I can hear my say. Go with him through the judgment. 
things usually at invitation time one is God hears us sing those words now some of you and I, I'm just telling you, some of you are honest enough you ain't singing uh, and I, I at least would appreciate the honesty I can't sing that I'm not gonna sing that I would challenge you to please let God change your heart let God change your heart you know me I don't I don't I don't drag out for lack of a better word invitations but God's Spirit's moving. He's been moving all week. He's been moving all week. And another thing I, I try to remind our people, you know, some of us, some of us when we were little, somebody said, oh, in essence, you want to go to heaven? Raise your hand. Okay, you're saved. And nobody explained to us what that meant. They said things like, oh, just invite Jesus to be a part of your life. They didn't explain to us like Abram explained. No, no, no. Jesus ain't a part of your life. Jesus is your life. Is your life. Some of you, you got to get mad at your church because you felt like you got sold. A, you got you got hoodwinked. You got sold a bill of goods kind of thing. It's like I thought all I had to do was give Jesus a part of my life. And Sunday at eleven o'clock, that's the part he gets. And now I come and hear this. This is the gospel truth. Amen. You enter into an agreement with Jesus. It says Jesus. I know you gave your life for me. Guess what? Now I'm going to give my life for you. You died for me. I'll live for you. Anything less than that, we're just playing games. So I'm going to ask Sue to play through at least one more time if, if nobody comes. If you want to come and spend some time at the altar or do business with God, we got no. We got food here. We don't have to leave anytime soon. We got food. We'll bring it up here if we need to. I guess I don't know. But it's just with your heads bowed, eyes closed, as Sue's plays, will you listen to the Spirit's leading? Rushing off now. Uh, if our if, if our kitchen crew want to sneak.